Last week we finished up two weeks on the gift of tongues, and I promised we'd give you any time which you wanted before we started on the permanent gifts to see if there are any lingering questions, uh, confusion, and if there is, believe me, you're, you're in good company, okay? <laughs> because, uh, there's so much to pull together, it's kind of hard to keep it all in in our mind once we do uh, start getting an understanding of it. So anybody have a question or maybe just a comment or uh, anything regarding the gift of tongues? I find it really interesting that uh, since you started teaching in here, the number of times I've heard others picking up that mantle and teaching and sharing different pastors and teachers on the radio. It's been interesting. There seems to be an increase in communicating about the spiritual gifts in this. Is, you know, I don't know. You know, it's just strange. That, well, that, that's good to hear because normally you don't hear much about it. Yeah. Anybody else? If not, we'll move on. Everything we've had so far has been, I mean, you really got to Think about it, concentrate on it. It's, it's not a lot of practicality for us in the day to day, but everything gets better from here on out. Well, I will say, I've heard like a one hour talk several times about gifts. <laughs> I've never heard one so in depth. Thank you. You're very welcome. We're only 60% finished. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm glad you're finding that helpful. Because sometimes when you have a long series like this, you wonder if maybe you're, uh, people are ready to move on to something else. But uh, trust me, when we, when we get to the permanent gifts, we're talking about now. We're talking about our lives. We're talking about our church. Our experience. And... There are some uh, confusion over the permanent gifts, unfortunately. And again, they're not highly emphasized. And the first thing that runs through people's minds <laughs> up to the list is how do I know what gift I have? What I'm going to tell you may sound counterintuitive. What I'm going to tell you is don't worry about it. When we get to the end, we get finished with the last one, I will give you the scriptural process for finding out. But it's not, it's not anything that is, that you can put on paper. I know there's all these uh, spiritual gifts assessments and things, and I'm not saying they are all bad. Uh, I think they are somewhat helpful if somebody is well versed in the subject and a mature believer. Uh, but they are not a lot of help sometimes for new believers or folks that are not really you know, versed on this subject. Uh, we, we tend to, we take a self-assessment, we always put ourselves, we tend to put ourselves where we think we want to be, or we should be. And it, it's really difficult to be honest about you know who you are and what you are. Uh, and that, that's the real problem. Uh, I remember years ago, I, I used one of those and had a young man and, uh, and I was teaching eight, eight permanent gifts and uh, asked people to consider what they may have and had a little evaluation and all that. And this young man decided he had all eight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I got one. I'm mean, Beyond that, I'm not real sure. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that nobody had them all except probably the apostles. So, so that, that's kind of the problem, but uh, there is a scriptural procedure, and it, it's exciting when you see it, and I'll just give you a little bit of a, a teaser here. It has to do with just being the Christian you ought to be today. Mm -hmm. It'll lead to your understanding of what your gift is. Uh, and even if it doesn't, you'll be using it, because God gave it to you, and it's there. So, 
Uh, it's not imperative that you know exactly what it is, at least in the short run. It'll take time, you'll become aware of it. The gift of ministry. Where we're going to begin. Some translations will say service or the gift of serving, which is the basic meaning of the word. But a lot of the translations use the term ministry. And so we kind of go by that. But we're not talking about the pastoral ministry. We're not talking about, I've been called to the ministry, as people call it, uh, when someone feels like that God's leading them into that uh, area of work. Uh, it's ministry with a little M, you might say, as one author used to say in a book I read years ago. Is it the big M ministry and the little M ministry? Everybody thinks of the big M ministry because that's the one that's up front and everybody sees and that's considered a ministry and everybody else thinks they're not in the ministry. The truth of the matter is we're all in the ministry. We're all servants. And some are gifted in particular to fulfill that role. Okay, let's go back to the catalog of 17 gifts. We had this early on, I think, uh, lesson two, maybe three. And uh, you go just go through the scriptures. And what I've done here, just go through the New Testament scriptures in chronological order and list all the gifts. That's where we began. And then we separated out the temporary ones based on 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. So you might say, well, Okay, how do we know a permanent gift's permanent? Because they're not called temporary. Okay? <laughs> There's nothing in the scripture that says anything about any of these eight gifts having ceased, passed away, or become inoperative. And they're not connected. They're not any of these eight found in that list in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, where all the temporary ones are there, and they're all connected in those three classes. So because they're not, so we have to understand they're permanent gifts. We start in Romans 12, 6, and the first one he mentions is prophecy, that's temporary. The next one he mentions is ministry or serving, that's in Romans 12, 7. The others are teaching, exhortation, which probably could be better called encouraging or encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy. And then there are two more. In 1 Corinthians 12, in the latter part of the chapter, chapter 12, verse 28, helping and administration. But those are the eight. Do you have a list on your sheet today? I don't think you do. Uh, but you have it on an earlier handout. So let's go back now and just look at the list of the eight permanent gifts. Here they are. You might want to jot them down at this point. <coughs> Ministry or serving, teaching, exhortation or the gift of encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy, administration, helping. Now, at first glance, you might say, well, that just doesn't seem like that's, that's enough. We need more gifts than that, right? But what we need to understand is each gift can be applied to a vast array of different ministries. And some people with the gift of exhortation use it in a personal way, one-on-one. -on -one. Some people go into counseling work. You know, there, there's various things. Other people, you know, employ it uh, in various ways, and we'll get into that. So if you, if you put all the possible ministry applications together with these gifts, it is, it is a huge array of important places in the body of Christ. See, everybody with the gift of teaching is not a pastor in the sense that he's preaching every Sunday morning. Some people may have the gift of teaching, they teach an ABF, or they uh, teach new converts, or they might even teach in a school, right? So there's plenty of different places for people with that gift to uh, exercise that gift. All right, so the gift of ministry or serving. The gift of ministry is one of eight permanent gifts listed in Romans 12. <coughs> In verse 7, here we see it. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of faith, of his faith, if service in his serving. Now when it says in service in his serving, 
there is no really good way <laughs> to translate this word for word into English and get the meaning. What, what it is, is, is basically saying, the one who has the gift of service ought to serve. That's exactly what the Greek says. If you have the gift of serving, serve. If you have the gift of teaching, teach. If you have the gift of exhortation, exhort. Here it says, if service in his serving. That, that's just following up in a more readable fashion after saying if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. But what is the proportion of his faith? Well, in the Greek, it says in proportion of the faith. It's a definite article. It's talking about in proportion to uh, the whole realm of faith. It's not talking about do I have enough faith to serve or do I have enough faith to teach. But it's your part of the whole, the faith, that you exercise. So if you are a servant, you serve. And he's going to say the same thing about teaching, or the same thing about mercy, the same thing about reading, all the way through as we go through these in Romans 12. So the gift of ministry is one of eight permanent gifts. Romans 12. Permanent gifts are present in the church, were present in the church from the beginning, and occurred alongside the temporary gifts. It wasn't like they took over. They will always been there. From the beginning, just like the temporary gifts. The temporary gifts became inoperative. Now again, remember, we talked about this. The gifts that were temporary became inoperative. But the, the things they did did not go away. And for example, the gift of healing, someone can heal people, but God still heals people, even though particular individuals don't have the power to affect that. Well, they can pray, and God can break that. But uh, the gift is inoperative in that sense. So in that regard, the temporary gifts, are, their function is really expanded to all believers, when you think about it. Because we all, play, we all pray for healing, right? Or other things represented by uh, the temporary gifts. Well, they're considered permanent because they are not designated to be temporary in the scriptures. I already said that. So let's look at the word translated ministry. This is the word in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Translated ministry. Same word in Romans 12. I shouldn't say the word in Romans 12, 7. Same word in 1 Corinthians 12 as well. It's translated ministry. It's the Greek word diakonia, which is the word from which we get the English deacon. Diakonos, deacon. The English translations took the Greek word and just put it into English letters and made the term deacon in English. And it occurs in our New Testament. The Greek word diakonos means table servant or servant in general. Anybody that ministers to the needs of somebody else. Which is exactly what the deacons did. Although the seven men chosen in Acts 6 are now not called deacons in Acts 6. The word or what they did is from where that designation came from. We'll see that in a moment. So the word used to refer, the word is used to refer to acts of ministry or service. So let's look at Acts 6.1, and we'll do that in a moment. The word is also used to designate the office of the deacon in 1 Timothy 3.8. It always refers to caring for a need or providing a service. Now, with all this in mind, and this is on your, your handout right here, I want to put these two verses on the screen. You may want to turn to them. Here's Acts 6, 1 first. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews. Hellenistic Jews were Jews that came in from all parts of the empire. They were Greek in culture, Hellenistic. And a lot of them that were saved stayed in Jerusalem. It was the only church there was. They didn't go back to where they came from. And so they, along with the native Hebrews that, we have, that were living in Jerusalem, Judea, Galilee, and so forth, that also stayed there and formed that first church, the church in Jerusalem, they're all together in one church. They're two different cultures, two different groups. Now believe me, you say, well, church, you know, church should be a place where we don't have those divisions. Well, it should be. 
Believe me, I moved to North Carolina, I became a pastor of a church in North Carolina. It probably took me 10 years before the people in North Carolina thought of me as one of them instead of an outsider because I came from West Virginia. <laughs> I mean, no, it wasn't anything, it wasn't anything uh, that, that it made a lot of difference, but it just, that's the way they thought. I don't know, you'll probably find the same thing in Texas. I, probably some people probably think I'm an outsider in Texas. I don't, you've never treated me that way. But I'm, we just tend to do that. It takes a while to overcome that. So that led to a problem here in the church because their widows, the Hellenistic Jews, had widows who were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. That verb, serving, same word in the noun form called ministry in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Deacons were chosen to step in because the who was serving the widows, who were taking care of their needs before the deacons? The apostles. Or, or maybe volunteers, I don't know. But the apostles had to step back from it for sure and give themselves to prayer to ministry of the word. So they chose, had to, the people choose seven men of a, a certain character, uh, godly men, to take over this ministry. From the very beginning, deacons were servants, but they were also serving in an administrative capacity. They weren't doing it all, they were overseeing it, but the church had thousands of people. Just not. Now we go to 1 Timothy 3.8, and now the term diakonos, servant, has become uh, a technical term in the church to refer to an office that has been and is now called the office of deacon. First Corinthians chapter, excuse me, first Timothy chapter three, verse eight. Paul says deacons, and he's given the qualifications of deacon after just giving the qualifications of a bishop, elder, pastor, all the same. I think it's called bishop in first Timothy three one. Uh, he finishes the, the qualifications for the pastor, then he goes on to the qualifications of the deacon. In verse 8, and he says, deacons likewise. Likewise, the pastor had qualifications, the deacons got qualifications, but will they be chosen? Well, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, dignity, not double tongue, not addicted to much wine, food, and so on. The office, the function. Okay? Now, let's go on. The gift of ministry should not be considered an unimportant gift. But, but routinely, when we think of a servant, that's what we think of. Somebody that's doing the lower level menial stuff, right? You see, that's only in the world's view. It's not God's view. In fact, serving, Jesus set forth as a true test of greatness. I don't have this on screen. So you might want to turn there. Matthew chapter 20. I put it on my phone. I have my phone on the table. I have my Bible at home. It's been one of those mornings, okay? So, so uh, you get your Bible out and look at it. So Matthew chapter 20. The disciples get into a discussion, you might call it an argument, over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And it's primarily going on between James and John and Peter and the guys that really had the most responsibility and kind of were the head people among the twelve, the primary group. And the other ones hear this going on and they, they get kind of upset because they're not included. And they come to Jesus to complain about their complaining and Jesus said, look, the greatest, basically, we on this. The greatest among you will be the what? The servant of all. <laughs> greatness is attached to service. What did Jesus do in John 13, 3 to 5? Anybody remember? Right off hand? Wash the disciples' feet. Wash the disciples' feet in the upper room. As they entered in. He took the role. He, ex he set an example of being the most menial servant. For those men, yeah. And of course, when we look at uh, Mark 10, verse uh, 45, when he says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. 
Yeah. And what he was telling them about greatness, he was it. Uh, his very life, his incarnation, everything. And he, he, he gives them another example of that, John 13. Wasn't like he hadn't said it before. But they didn't get it. It'd be like going into a corporation and going to the CEO and said, you know, the greatest person here is the janitor. Really? I mean, potentially. Would they accept that thinking? No. This is what the disciples had trouble with. Jesus said, in a, you know, he mentioned the Gentiles, the world, the cultures, it's different. But this is the reality. Two of Paul's associates probably had the gift of ministry. Now, I say probably because we can't know. But there's some hints. And I think the best way to understand sometimes these gifts is to make sure that you find it in the book of Acts. I went to a lot of trouble with all the gifts, the temporary gifts and the permanent gifts. Go back to the book of Acts and see if I can identify individuals who quite possibly had the gift and look at what they did or what's said about them. And then that brings us to where we're at uh, as far as understanding it. The first one is Tychicus. Now, in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, you don't have to turn there, you may want to, but in Acts 20, verse 4, we learned that he was a companion of Paul's on Paul's third missionary journey. One of those, in fact, Paul had several that traveled with him, that, that assisted him, that served him, uh, that, that were involved in his ministry. Paul wasn't a one-man show. Never was he a one-man show. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 21 and 22, where Paul says something about Tychicus. Ephesians 6, 21 and 22. Now so that you also may know my circumstances, writing to the, the church in Ephesus. At this point, Paul is imprisoned. His first imprisonment, he's imprisoned in Rome, under house arrest probably at this point in Rome. And we read in chapter 6, as he writes back to Ephesus, from which Tychicus came. Now, so that you also may know about my circumstances as to what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful servant of the Lord, will make everything known to you. He's sending Tychicus to Ephesus. And what does he call him? A faithful servant. Same word used to refer to in English gift of ministry in Romans 12, 7, and in 1 Corinthians as well. So Paul calls him that. Now, Paul could have just used that as a general description because pretty much any believer could be referred to that way. We understand that. But, Tychicus, companion of Paul in that third journey, now who, after that third journey ends, he goes on that, he gets into that problem in Jerusalem, he appeals to Caesar, he ends up in Rome. Tychicus right there with him. Paul can't go back to Ephesus. Tychicus can't. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. What was Tychicus' area of ministry here? He was a messenger. No telephones, no internet, no postal service, word of mouth, or letters carried. It was a message. Now, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm sure there were many other things he did if he was a, had the gift. But here is an example of someone who's called a servant, called a minister, and how he was used in a very practical way. Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. 
Colossae and Ephesus near together, near each other, in Asia Minor. So Tychicus goes back and he carries the letters of Ephesians and Colossians. He was entrusted to carry God's word. He, the only copy of it, other than maybe what Paul wrote down originally, that was a copy over. It would have been one or two. And he's entrusted to carry that. They don't have the word of God in Ephesus and Colossae. They're not just part of it. And Tychicus is the one that's entrusted to take it, deliver it. A trusted servant. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant, there it is again. Same word you find in Romans 12, 7, where it's translated ministry. The gift of ministry or the gift of service. It doesn't say he has the gift of service here. Can't be 100% sure. But it's interesting that Paul call, every time Paul talks, talks about Tychicus, he, he mentions he's a servant. A faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord will bring you information. For I have sent him, there is, he's a messenger again, to Colossae also, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances, and that you may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, anybody remember him? Book of Philippine, you check that out. I'm not going to get into it. Okay. But, um, and with Onesimus, our faithful beloved brother, who is one of your number, this will inform you about the whole situation here. Okay? Yeah. What was the significance at that time of the term bond servant? I'm sorry, say that again. The significance back uh, during that period of time for the term bond servant? Uh, I think it goes back to the Old Testament terminology of a bond servant. Uh, a bond servant was somebody who, well, they weren't necessarily forced to be a slave, but they entered into being a bond servant willingly in the Old Testament law, had regulations for how they would be taught. Someone had a huge debt, they could work it off that way. They were in bond to the person they owed the debt to. And I think he's just using that terminology. Saying Paul was a bond servant of Christ, and he was too. I, I, I think what... Okay. Two of Paul's associates probably had to give the ministry. Tychicus is one, and Epaphroditus is the other one. It's possible. Epaphroditus. These are not, these are not household words, right? <laughs> <laughs> Greek names, Greek names, Greek name, Gentiles have come to Christ under Paul's ministry. Associates of Paul, working with him in the ministry. Tychicus and Epaphroditus. Let's go to Philippians 2.25. But I thought it necessary. Now he's, he, he's communicating to the Philippian church. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Now, that is not the same word you find in Romans 12, 7, but it's a synonym for it. So I think it's quite likely, it's quite possible Paul uses another term of servant here, just happened to use that, that in this passage. But it may also refer to someone Paul looked at whose ministry was serving. And he sent, just like Tychicus was sent, verse 18 of chapter 4. But I have received everything in full and have in abundance. Epaphroditus brought a gift from Philippi to Paul in prison. And now Paul is sending Epaphroditus back. But I've received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. A fragrant aroma and, accept, aroma and acceptable sacrifice for all pleasing of God. So what, there we know the, the Philippian church used Epaphroditus to bring provisions to Paul. Paul sends him back. And... Uh, He, he probably also carried back the book of Philippians, another New Testament letter, just like Tychicus, Ephesians, and Colossians. Same type of ministry. Okay, now here's where it gets fun. It gets 
spoke, just spoke, excuse my English. You take a church of 200 people, say, how many do you reckon have the gift of serving? I don't know. If God did it equally, God by the age of the 200, what is that? I don't know. Between 15 and 20, right? I don't but who's to say that people don't have multiple gifts? It's a quite, it could be a quite well distributed gift in the body. Not everybody with the gift of serving will be called to a particular, or will be called to the same ministry, but to some particular <clears throat> So I would suggest to you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this with all the permanent gifts. What are the ministry applications for someone with the gift of serving? Well, there are church applications, personal applications, and even career applications. So, what do you think, as far as the ministry of Conroe Bible Church, what are some of the ministries in Conroe Bible Church that a person with the gift of serving would excel in? What would they do? There are many. Teaching, greater, preaching, greeting, um, volunteering. Really? Yeah. volunteering. All of the ministries. Doing the food to the people who need it. Um, Coming to the church work day. <laughs> what about musicians? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They're using their talent. They're serving. What about the, the sound and audio people, IT people? Yeah, they can fit in there. Uh, class, I mean, people. I don't know how you all do it. I know you have a sign that people break breakfast, right? <laughs> Serving. Uh, there's just a whole host of things. Uh, kids camp in the summer, uh, assisting in ministries. Uh, Awana. Awana means a lot of service. Yeah. You know, some people without the gift of serving might find some of that type of ministry unappealing. But a true servant finds it fulfilling. Do you not think everybody has a little bit of serving in them? It just may not be what you just said. It may not be toward the children, but it may be toward greeting. Yeah. So I think there's yeah. a little bit of that in all of us. We just don't pull it out. Well, we're all, we should all be servants. Mm -hmm. exactly. There's no question about that. I'm just saying some people are going to find a great fulfillment in it because that's their purpose and role. You know, and I think that they could be better at it. They could not be depending on their development, but um, yeah, most of these gifts, are, most of them, not all of them, but most of them will have um, application to everybody because we're told to do that very thing. We're told to exhort one another. Hebrews 10, 25, exhort one another. So much more as you see the day approach. Remember that. That's for everybody. But some people have that gift. True. How about personal? Your personal life. You know, I know gifts are there that we might edify others in the body of Christ. There's people in your neighborhood that are not going to, are not members of, of, of Calvary Bible Church. They might be members of Northside Baptist Church or, or some other church here or some other church there. They're part of the body of Christ. Some people develop whole ministries just in their neighborhood. I, I know that to be very true because my wife's done that very thing in our neighborhood. Uh, you don't have to have a position. You don't have to have a ministry even in your church. A gift is in your life. A gift is to be used. What are what are some uh, any personal applications? I can tell you what. I was a first year seminary student. Uh, student. My wife had surgery. There was no family, there was nobody. I was the only one waiting while she had surgery. Then came this woman. <coughs> Sit down beside her. I've never met her. Now, 
she was a family member of a neighbor of my wife's back in West Virginia, so she knew of us in particular. So I just thought, well, that's nice. She knew we didn't have anybody, and she came. But as I sat there for a couple hours, talking to her, nobody else talked to me. <laughs> talking to her, you know, and I suddenly realized she kept talking about going to this person's surgery, going to that person's surgery, and this, this student, and I thought, this woman does this all the time. <laughs> this is what she does. I don't know exactly whether she had, she could have had multiple gifts, she could have been an encourager, but I know one thing, she was a servant. It wasn't anything anybody knew about it, it wasn't anything attached to a church community, just what she did in her life was who she was. So the application's are not in me. Jay, I'm, I'm, I've commented on this before, but I, I, I was, I'll never forget, there was a woman probably in her 80s, widow, in the church I attended in California when I was in the service there, that every Sunday she brought baked goods to the church. And Saturday was her day to make cookies or pies or cakes. And she gave them, she brought them to the church and she purposely looked for visitors to the church. That was their first or second time. And she would deliver those to those people in the church. And it made such an impression on these people. Many came back, maybe others did, but they always felt like they were loved because she, they got fresh baked cookies, cakes, pies. I just thought that great was example. great. Great example. I'm not sure nobody in the, in the, the church leadership said, would you be the cookie director? <laughs> <laughs> no, she just did it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it reminded me my second church I was at for over 30 years and our first few years there, there was a lady in the church who just kept breaking his food. And, you know, we discussed the different cultural things between states. She bought me food I've never ate before. <laughs> she bought me things I'd eaten before, but prepared differently. I was just, I don't know, just things that were common, I guess, in Eastern North Carolina. She brought coleslaw and always pickles in it. I never saw coleslaw and pickles. <laughs> but I really got to like it. <laughs> uh, I never had uh, vegetable soup without beef or hamburger in it. She made it with chicken. That's what they all do down there. They go with chicken. It didn't it seem strange? But you know, it's, but she just she brought food a couple times. I said, "That's nice." I'm a new pastor. And she's been nice. She just kept doing it. <laughs> it got to the point where about once a week she brought us a complete full cooked meal, plus cooking for her own family, and, and, and she cleaned houses and done that too. Just over and over and over. And uh, nobody asked her to be the, you know, the preferred cook in the congregation. <laughs> just, just what she did. So many personal applications. And there's career applications. What kind of careers would someone with a gift of service be attracted to? Or function well? Can you, can you think of it? Nurse. What? Nurse. Nursing? What else? Law enforcement. Law enforcement? Yeah. The you know, company that, that I work for? Serve, serve or oh, yes. The company that I work for provides back office services to nonprofit organizations. So we process all their donations and their expense, you know, expense, uh, reports and payroll and all that so we're serving the people who are, are out doing ministry it's just all kinds of applications food service customer service uh i mean things i never even thought about like you're talking about I mean, they're just so don't think don't think in terms of if i have a gift i can't use it but that's just that's just not you don't think there's no place in the church, they don't need it. Just do it. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be in the church. Anybody else? That might be all I got. Hold up. One more story. <laughs> You're going to love this.
story. His name was Melvin. Melvin was an elderly gentleman who moved to a town about four miles from my church. He and his wife when he retired. Faith came to church every week. Set in the same spot. I can still see the spot. Never missed unless he, something was sick or something. But he wasn't involved. He just, they were members, but he, he, he wasn't involved in the ministry. That's not all that unusual for a pastor to observe that. For example, you've got to be careful. Some people are not necessarily overly involved in church, but their ministries, like we just discussed, in some other capacity or application. <clears throat> Well, one year we had the vacation Bible school, I think y'all call it kids camp, and they always fix, well, we didn't always, but it, it doesn't happen, the one who's in charge that year decided they wanted to prepare a meal. This is partly because they went to year-round school, and it was difficult for parents and little ones to year round to, you know, to get them, get them home, and get them back, and, and have to get them something to eat. So they started, we started having an evening Bible school, and they started doing a meal, was, you know, Simple, but it's a meal. And Melvin was there that year grilling hot dogs. Something else I had to get used to in North Carolina. I have red hot dogs. I mean red. I must have to die of red. And they swear by them. They won't eat any other hot dogs. I got to like them, by the way. I have to. Uh, so Melvin's out there grilling hundred red hot dogs. Or maybe it was Amber. Well, that's nice to see Melvin get involved. Well, later on we had a fall festival, big kids of it. Melvin's out there grilling hot dogs. Next Bible school, the next youth event, Melvin's out there with his group. Over and over. We just it became Melvin's thing. Everybody, if they needed food, it was called Melvin. <laughs> Well, one of these events, I walked up to Melvin. I may have done it before, but on one of these events, at least, I walked up to him and I said, Melvin, I just really appreciate you doing this consistently and faithfully and so on. He said, let me tell you the story of how it happened. He said, okay. He said, you were, you were preaching on Exodus chapter 4. I said, well, yeah, that's been a while back. Were well, you were preaching on Exodus and Moses, and he was giving excuses to God. That's why he couldn't go back to Egypt. Here's that passage. And Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me. Because you're making excuses to God. Or, or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? What was in Moses' hand? Shepherd's shepherd staff. Forty years in the wilderness, keeping the sheep of Jethro. He's not anxious to go back to the place he had to flee from. And he said, and it was the Lord speaking, and he said, cast it on the ground. Well, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod or a shepherd's staff. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses had fled from it. I would have too, out of back home real quick. But then the Lord said this, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. How many of you would have done that? <laughs> I've taken a few snakes by the tail, but they were always little green snakes that I knew didn't have any bite, okay? <laughs> Don't ask me to take a copperhead by the tail. I would probably decline that. But Moses has been out there in the wilderness for a while. Maybe he wasn't as afraid of snakes as, as we are, okay? So he picks it up with a tail. Verse 4. And it became a rod again. <clears throat> The Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. He reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God, their father, is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. That was the sign God gave him to validate his ministry. And Melvin said to me, when you preach that message on Exodus 4, or Genesis, you ask the congregation the question, what is that in your hand? I did. 
nice homiletical <laughs> appeal. I never thought about it in specific terms. In specific terms. Melvin said, when you asked that question, I said to myself, I have my grill and I have my grilling tools. <laughs> it became a servant. Yeah. That's what servants do. They do what they can, they take what they have, and they give. It's a wonderful, blessed ministry. It's not unimportant. It is the very essence of greatness according to Jesus Christ. I'm done early. That's because you didn't spend 15 minutes on tongues like I thought you might. So I'm done early, so you might as well, you know, spend it on uh, spend it on the gift of ministry or not. Anybody have a word you'd like to add? God personally told you to take that snake up by the tail. You're going to tell him no. <laughs> I'd give it a try, but I don't know how he I don't know how to be fast enough. I think it'll be a little hesitant. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, those of us who have been in the church for a number of years remember Dale Keaton and his wife. I was thinking of him when he was talking. When, if you needed anything done around the church, particularly in the kitchen, Dale was always there. Always there. And uh, when he passed away, there was a loss. You don't realize how important somebody is in their capacity as a servant until they're gone. He, he took Gladys. care of all of our grounds as well. Yes. Yeah. And he and Gladys would fish. And then cook the fish on the grill for the church July 4th, July 4th, yeah. Precious man. Well, I became the pastor of North Carolina. I had a deacon. His name was Wayne. He was a firefighter, career firefighter, drove the truck. The servant in his occupation. Well, that he was a farmer. Jack of all trades. <clears throat> Firemen work 24 hour shifts. They're off 24 hour shifts. Maybe two days, I don't know. And uh, showed up one day to mow my yard. I had about a three quarters of an acre. And I had a push mower. He showed up one day with his riding mower and <laughs> knocked it out. Next week he came back in again. So, wait, let me tell you. No, no, I just want to do this for you. He mowed my yard for years, 14 years in all. Never charged a penny. Gave me a lot of more time in my schedule. He also mowed the grass in the church. The church paid him a meager fee to do it. Like every year, the, the financial people tried to get him to take more money and refuse it every year. And he did way more than cut the grass. He was there to remove ice in the winter time. He, he did the landscaping. He did everything. Just a servant. One year, I guess 1996, Hurricane Fran came through, hit down about Myrtle Beach, came right through Raleigh. There's trees down everywhere. Big mess. We were without electric for five days. It was in the uh, September, it was 95 degrees in the shade. No electricity, no air conditioning. Well, he took it upon himself to get in his vehicle, his truck, and drive 200 miles and bring back ice chests full of ice mm -hmm. and distribute them. Mm -hmm. Sir, you, I, you, we can all think of people like this. This is exciting stuff, okay? That's why I say this is the fun part. And some of you, perhaps, you're going to say, gee whiz, I, I can do that, or I can do this, or I have this gift before we're done. That's exciting. We all finished? <laughs> wow, one time we were last long. I'm early, I'm early. Let's pray.